It's pornography for a reason. It doesn't make sense to want to have sex with somebody you don't trust. We're not being rigorous about our own healing. We're setting other people up to die. It is a person who views um, voyeuristic pornography a sex offender. These these men feel like a female is going to be the thing to fix that. People are scared of labeling sex as an addiction. My pain does not the only thing that defines me. Therapists will often have a harder time dropping into that space of imperfection. Don't be afraid of your imperfection. Let other people be inspired by it. The imperfect parts of us are the healing parts of us. Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I am your host, Ellie Nash. Join me weekly on my quest for more, more from myself and more from this world. We'll see you on the other side. Welcome. Welcome, Faith. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, the algorithms are sensitive, so we got to say something interesting like, right away. <laughs> so immediately. <laughs> People have attention spans of 15 seconds. So. Like they're already off. Now we lost the opportunity. Yeah, they're done. Okay, now we only have the diehard people left. <laughs> now we can, <laughs> can say what needs to be said. So you probably don't go on your website too often, um, but I did. And you had a quote there, uh, which I liked because it's like I have an issue with therapists a little bit. <laughs> Should be fun then. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it kind of went up against that issue. So I, I guess you, you also do. Maybe you didn't make your site. I have no idea. But it said... Um, Something to the effect of, do you know the quote? Let others... Don't be afraid of your imperfection. Let other people be inspired by it, yeah. I believe is the quote. Correct. Actually, a direct quote. By? By me. Oh, yours. Okay. Very nice. I wasn't sure if it was you or one of the other yeah. Uh, yeah. practice. Nice. So do you know why that um, quote spoke to me, especially in relation to the therapists? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, I'd like to hear more. I could guess. We could. I could go full <laughs> therapist right out the gate and guess, but... <laughs> I did a um, an episode a while ago with um, Omar Pinto, who's a recovery coach based in Costa Rica. I worked with him for a few years. Now he's somewhat of a medicine man plus coach. And we did one called um, Therapy versus Coaching. Mm-hmm. And did you see that? I saw there? parts of it, yeah. So parts of it. So uh, my challenge there essentially was not obviously a, a coach can behave as a therapist, a therapist can behave as a coach. But the the idea that's gotten in my head somehow, not from nowhere, from experience, is that therapists will often have a harder time dropping into that space of imperfection and being open about it, whereas a coach will say, hey, I've earned my stripes by being where where you were and, and now I'm not. Do you know what I'm talking about? No, exactly what you're talking about, <laughs> actually. And I think as you're saying this, I'm like, it sounds to me like what I think people think of when they're going to a therapist is, okay, I'm going to somebody who's going to sit there silently and maybe judge me or come from a one-up type of place. And as you're saying this, I'm like, yeah, that's not how I got better. And that's not how I was trained as a therapist. I think that the imperfect parts of us are the healing parts of us. Um, and there are benefits to coaching and to therapy. And, and I think that if we're, if we're looking at what a therapist really needs to be in order to be effective, it's a, it's a person who's healed and so that they can heal others. So our imperfection is part of that healing. And our vulnerability with appropriate boundaries is what helps other people get better. Correct. Right. So what you're saying is that your healing is what enabled you to do that. And the, and the training and the th- degree, what, what does that do? <laughs> so what I say is that for me, I, it made what was unconscious conscious. My training made it so that everything that I had already experienced, I had now names. And of course, it gave me s- skills. It gave me clinical language. Um, it gave me clout. But the real reason why I ever became a therapist is because the healing work that I did I wanted to be able to give to other people. And in order to do that, and what I saw at the time was the most effective way, it was to get trained to be a therapist. Um, I actually started off my, I was a fine art major. I did not intend to be a therapist. I had been in therapy since I was 13, and I just thought that I was too emotionally not well <laughs> to ever be a therapist. Um, and God had a different plan for me because it just, it kept showing up in my life, and then I was in a psychology course in undergrad because I needed an elective, and my professor was so challenging and confrontational while also loving and nurturing, and it was something about his approach that I was like, I want to do this. He was very human as so a So you were taking clinician. a course yeah. in school, and yeah. then 
Yeah. And so then I switched my degree. Um, from there on out, I went on, down the route of getting a psychology undergrad. So, and that, w- and then what you thought was your liability, whatever you were dealing with in therapy, as a young teenager, became your asset. For sure. Therapy. Do you speak about that? Are you comfortable yeah. speaking about that? Yeah, I'm comfortable speaking about it. I think it's, um, it's definitely part of my journey. I was, I've been in twelve step since I was eighteen, so I'm been really used to sharing my story. Um, <laughs> and then this, I think, goes back to like it's not typical for therapists, appropriate boundaries of the client to share their story, but it's something that I've decided is, is worth sharing. You know, I think that, um, it's important to see that just because I've gotten to a certain place doesn't mean it wasn't without the hard earned work. So I, at 13 at the time I was in therapy because of suicide and untreated drug abuse. You didn't addiction. actually commit suicide. I, I tried to commit suicide. Yeah. Commit suicide. So prior to joke. that, it was what? It was a joke. Oh, Jews make jokes about things like that. <laughs> Suicide. I wasn't Jewish <laughs> no, then yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> so are you comfortable talking about what that was? What yeah. Was so was? in 13, I ended up in therapy after a suicide. At 13. At 13. Um, I had a suicide attempt after really it was early drug addiction that was not getting treated. And, and for me, it was showing up in suicidal ideation at the time because I was so miserable and I was in so much pain and I was really in the beginning of my drug use and it wasn't, I wasn't using enough yet to not feel. And the feelings were still too overwhelming and ended up hospitalized, ended up in individual therapy. And I was really young. I was not ready. And I remember not ready for, I wasn't ready I wasn't ready to really heal because I thought there was something still fundamentally wrong with me. And looking back at the therapist, she was, she really did try to just point out the fact that I was a normal teenager going through life things. She tried to incorporate my family. My mom stormed out and said she wouldn't have pay somebody to tell her what's wrong with her. Which is, what's wrong with her? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is what's wrong with her. Um, and, and so at the time I remember really liking my therapist and I remember two things she taught me. Um, she taught me about codependency cause I was in a super codependent relationship, uh, at the time and with an older, um, gentleman and not, I mean, he was 16 and I was 13. It was inappropriate, right. but it wasn't, it wasn't so dramatic that anybody was intervening and, Um, so she taught me about codependency and that I can be a healthy circle separate from another person who still overlaps instead of two circles enmeshed with each other. And I actually still use that same visual today. It's something that I teach in intensives. It's something that I teach my individual clients. I teach other therapists is this idea of like, it's just a really simple visual and it's stuck with me over 22 years later. So Um, that's one thing. And the other thing that she taught me was what it felt like to be safe. Uh, there was nothing that I ever brought to her session. She taught you or showed you? She showed me. Yeah. She showed me what it felt like. It was the first time I experienced being honest and like waiting for the shoe to drop. Like when's this, when's she going to react to me? When's she going to think I'm crazy? When's she going to think there's something wrong with me? Like I was testing her. I was in a, I was a teenager and I was doing a good job at being a teenager. So it was the first time you experienced safety within yeah. a relationship. Yeah. Got it. Um, from somebody who I thought was going to just use their power to exert authority over me. And that's what I think most people think when they go to a therapist is this is somebody who could possibly, even if it's subconscious, the belief is I'm going somewhere to be vulnerable or try to get help from somebody who could use their power to exert control over me. And I don't think that that's effective therapy if a client feels like that in the room. Right. I'm thinking before I went to therapy, I had this association of this is someone who can analyze me and know what I'm thinking. And I didn't like that. I was uncomfortable with that. Do therapists have to be good at analyzing people? I'm not into <laughs> analyzing people. But. I'm not into analyzing people. The joke I always make, like, cause if you're a therapist, if you're in a social situation, everybody's like, Oh, don't analyze me. You know, like I hear that all the time. I'm like, I don't, I don't work if I'm not getting paid to work. I don't want to work outside of work um, unless I'm in some workaholism and then I really want to work. But no, I, um, I don't analyze. I think the, the goal is to get curious enough to figure out the problem together. I mean, the reality is, is that I do have wisdom or training or expertise that 
my clients don't. That's why they're coming to me for that help. But if I'm analyzing, I'm putting distance, I'm separating myself, I'm making myself bigger than them. And that's not how I think we heal. So one of the first things I learned in recovery is that um, we don't think about people as much as we experience them. So I just remember this in as a child, I just heard this expression so much of, what do you think about them? What do you think about mm-hmm. him? What do you think about her? What do you think about that person? And one day in 12 steps, it just clicked that this, it's, not, it's not what I think about someone that matters. It's the experience of that person that's more useful. I'll, I'll even bring this into business where a much more meaningful part of my interview it, with someone, if I'm interviewing someone for a job, is the way I feel after speaking with them mm-hmm. than the specific skills. Like what is my experience of interacting with them is a much more useful data point than do they have the skills necessary to do this, that, or the other thing. Back to you. There was a question. Uh, there was When I um, went through your website before this, I noticed you called out intensive therapy. That's not something I've seen often. Mm-hmm. I've done some of it myself, mm-hmm. and I know there are a few therapists who, who do it. Can you, sp- can you speak to it, the benefits of it, what, what it is you, you guys offer? And this is unique, right? I don't see a lot of therapists offer. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few, not quite a few, there's a handful of really amazing intensive centers. And then there's also some practices similar to ours that will do more intensive work. But I came to the intensive model uh, for from my experience as a therapist and working with trauma, working with addiction, most of my clients, as well as, again, my personal experience, is that I would come into a session, and and if it's a one-hour session, I have 10 minutes of warm-up, and then five to 10 minutes of wrap-up, so I'm not leaving the session a complete mess. And then that leaves 30 minutes of processing, and how can I really get to the deeper healing work if there's only 30 minutes of real safety and and time to get to those guts of what's going on. And then a week in between that. And then a week in between. So then you have to button up and pretend like everything's fine for a week. And like, (laughs) oh, by the way, also you need to go do all your therapy homework and take care of your kids or um, show up at school or whatever's going on in your life and pretend like you're not also digging open your soul for an hour a week. This doesn't. So an intensive looks like that. You just block out, let's say, four hours. Yeah. So I have individual in-person intensives will be anywhere from four to eight hours or a couple days at a time, depending on availability. And then I also do group intensives um, where there'll be multiple groups a day, anywhere from four to 10 people at the most. I like to keep them small. And we work through a model of trauma as well as sex addiction or love addiction um, issues so that they can get that more group experience because I think there's value within individual intensives but there's also a huge value with group intensives you're seeing somebody else heal through something that you may not have known you needed for yourself so So a group intensive will be with one or more therapists Mm -hmm. guiding them and then everyone's kind of witness to that yeah that healing yeah so the other thing about that is like we get to work together as a team that's the one thing about being a private practice therapist that became really hard is it's lonely especially if you work more collaboratively. I also got trained in a private practice that we worked together as a team. So I really modeled after where I was working in Orlando, this, this practice and it's fulfilling for me. It's how I want to live, which is in community and in conversations with other therapists. And it keeps me in check um, as well as gives me like an outlet. And I love really, really happy with our team. It's nice. We staff every week. I get to not be isolated in my profession. And then patients who come to your clinic will work with multiple therapists. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you, you mentioned sex and love addiction, or maybe I should say sex addiction and love addiction. Are there three different things, sex addiction, love addiction, and sex and love addiction? So. <laughs> Can we pull it all apart? Can we yes. define some of these yes. things? Yes. So there's sex addiction, and then there's love addiction. And if you want to throw another hat in the ring, there's codependency. <laughs> Okay. So, um, and I think most people coming to my practice are dealing with one of those three or don't realize they're dealing with it until they get into a therapeutic process because um, it's a bit, I think love addiction is harder to identify than sex addiction. Codependency is even more difficult. And I mean codependency in in an unhealthy way. I think interdependency is super healthy. Codependency is more of this, I need you to be okay for me to be okay 
which doesn't look exactly like love addiction, although love addiction has aspects of codependency. But it and could be similar. It can be similar. So can we define each one, sex addiction? Yeah. Sex addiction is I'm using sex in order to achieve a desired result outside of myself that is avoidant of intimacy. I can make that less clinical if it's, you want. No, I got it. It's yeah. consistent with um it's consistent with some things I've shared on it, which is not clinical, just my experience of my own mm -hmm. um sex addiction. So it resonates and I think with people who've heard me talk on the subject a few times it um it lands. What do you say to people uh, who say there's no such thing as sex addiction, that one cannot be addicted to something that's not a drug? They just haven't had it yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I think people are scared of labeling sex as an addiction because of that moralizing. Um, we think that it means that we're moralizing sexual behavior in a negative light and that it's not sex positive. So usually the people who are against the idea of identifying sex addiction are afraid of the moral consequences of identifying it as an addictive disorder. So being anti-sex or using that sex addiction diagnosis to control or be more puritanical, which is not control. Oh, I would have said it's funny that you went that direction because I would have gone the other direction is that suggesting that something is an addiction means that this person doesn't have enough control over it. So it mm. doesn't have control over it. It's like, it's a disease the same way alcohol or drugs are. There's a more compassionate approach. So now if I, if I say that about a sex offender, for example, Oh, they're right. just, they're an addict. They can't help themselves. Like we can't be quite as angry as we want to be. Right. Right. And I think that that's true for some people. There's also, Another area that I think is huge to define is the difference between sex addiction and sex offending. I think we've had that conversation. It's possible. Um, but say it here because. Yeah. So most sex addicts are not offenders. So I would say 95% of sex addicts are not offenders. Um, sex addiction is also not a moral dilemma. dilemma and the, the criteria for sex addiction is the same as what we would look at substance abuse disorder or substance use disorders is the increased tolerance, um, use despite consequences. There's, there's these very structured criteria, whereas sex offending is more about behavioral violations. Uh, some sex addicts do cross into offending behavior. It's the nature of the progression of addiction. But if you're looking at a sex offender template versus a sex addiction template, a sex addict who is committing offending behaviors, it's, it's part of their progression of their disease. They don't have initial offending behaviors that have started at the beginning of their sexual history timeline that we do, whereas offenders have a profile that fits with offending behavior from a young age. Typically. Offending behavior would either mean something with a child or a violence. So offending behavior really includes kind of a wider scope than I think we think about sex offenders. If you say the word sex offender to not me or you, um, people are going to think about child offenses or rape. contact, yeah, violent contact offenses like rape, whereas sex offending really is about violating somebody else's sexual boundary. So voyeurism, exhibitionism, frauderism, which is touching somebody without their permission. Right. Voyeurism is viewing somebody without their permission. Exhibitionism is exposing yourself without somebody's permission. Those are the areas where we actually see sex addiction cross into offending behavior more than any kind of contact violent offending because the contact violent, offender, violent offenders are more of that it's a very small percentage of the population that's doing that, but it's the one that gets the most attention because it's so disturbing for us, appropriately so, because it, it's violating the most vulnerable population in a really harmful way. Um, but that's a very small percentage of what's actually happening in offending behavior, which is also interesting. And most offending behavior is actually treatable. There's the violent contact offending typically has more of a sociopathic profile, so it's not as treatable, whereas the majority of offending behavior is highly treatable given the right circumstances, but it's a different type of treatment What's than sex What's the most common addiction. offending behavior? Voyeurism. Mm -hmm. is, is pornography voyeurism? Yes. <laughs> um, is it offending behavior? That's a very good question. <laughs> so is a person who views um, voyeuristic pornography a sex offender? Well, maybe all pornography is voyeuristic. So, and this is where also the lines between fetish or sexual arousal, healthy, normal sexual arousal, and sex addiction need to be really clear because every human 
has a curiosity. This is kids are born curious about sex. This is where so many kids end up in these really unfortunate situations where they're not getting treated appropriately because they're curious about sex. They look for sexual images, whether it's pornography or looking through somebody's window, and then they feel immense shame about that voyeuristic nature because nobody's teaching them healthy boundaries about how to handle their curiosity. So, do they feel immense shame or immense shame is imposed on them? I think immense shame is imposed on them. Yeah. Um, we also have natural feelings of this is not okay, guilt or healthy shame, depending on whose book you read. <laughs> um, but uh, kids typically do have a sense of I'm doing something wrong, but that's from a predisposed education that they've gotten in the family system, either overt or covert messages about what's okay about sex. I've seen it with my kids that had I not done some of the work I've done on my own addiction, comments that my three-year-old made to my two-year-old or would have thrown me off and I would have suggested that they're doing something wrong by being right. curious about a body part or something right. else. Right, right. Yeah, kids are our biggest growth edge, that's for sure. If, right. we, if we haven't healed something, our kids will point <laughs> it out in us. <laughs> right, meaning we can impose sexual yeah. shame on a child at a pretty, sure. pretty young age. When they have no concept of anything sexual and have no intention of even creating a pleasurable experience, it's just curiosity can be shamed. You were um, explaining sex addiction, and then you're going to go to love addiction. Yeah, so, so love addiction is about using the connection with somebody else to create a false sense of intimacy. So this is the differentiation between sex addiction and love addiction. Love addiction is um, avoidant of intimacy, and sex addiction is about trying to find intimacy but mistaking intensity for intimacy. So it, it's this deep craving for connection, acknowledgement, love, validation, um, something outside of us to make us feel more connected. So, and this Does is. Does it I often think, cut across gender lines? For sure. It was interesting working in the Orthodox community. I initially didn't start off my career in the Orthodox community. Um, since working in the Orthodox community for the last seven years, I see more men with love addiction in the Orthodox community than I ever saw in the secular community, which I think is interesting and, and we can talk more about it if you want. But. Let's talk more about it. Yeah. So I, I, spoke to a good friend of mine um, who's a referent and me and him were talking about this. I'm like, what do you think it is? And he was like, well, what do you think it's not? Right. Uh, the, the, the guys that are coming to me from the Orthodox community have strict, strict boundaries about what they're allowed to do. They um, have this emptiness unless they're achieving. So they're dependent on something external to give them internal worth. And whether that's Torah learning or mitzvahs or, um, or the opposite, like there's this condition to the external. And then also the other side of this is they're made to believe that relationships will heal them. I don't know if you experienced this, but like getting married and going through the shit process yeah. is the goal. You've, you're normal and healthy in life if you get married, uh, which automatically makes I was you over dependent. the hill at 24. Yeah. Yeah. Was, you're oh, <laughs> never. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so what happens is, is these, these men feel like a female is going to be the thing to fix them or the idea of a relationship is going to be the thing that may finally makes them feel good enough because all their life they've been working to be good enough with this You're saying love validation. addiction distinct from sex addiction. Distinct You're from saying. sex addiction. And no sex addiction present but love addiction. I've had both. So right. typically there's an overlap. Um, more so in men there's an overlap with sex and love addiction pop probably because it's more normalized for men to be more sexual than love addicted. Like I think that there's that pressure, like you can't just be a love addicted guy without sex addiction because then you might be considered like weak or the P word. Right. <laughs> and that, um, so there's almost like it's, it's easier to channel all the energy into sex addiction when really my motivation is to get the love. So there's also being, I think really mindful as a therapist who's treating this to untangle what the really core motivation is because somebody can look like a sex addict and really be a love addict and they're working on their sex addiction but not getting relief. From In order to get that intensity that love addiction has, is there a jumping to different people? Does it always need someone, someone new? So it doesn't even need a person. It could, need, it could just use fantasy. The, the hypothetical cosmic relationship that will cure me you know, and make all of my problems go away, that nurturing relief from whatever it is, the pain that I'm experiencing inside. So yeah, there's the jumping from person to person. Um, it can be the 
you're in the same relationship for your entire life, but not realizing that you're love addicted to your spouse. And typically what happens with love addiction is then there's also the, the opposite, which is the love avoidance. And same with sex addiction. Typically there's sex addiction and then Correct. sexual anorexia. So it's two sides of the same coin. Um, yeah, that's something I've seen, which a lot of people misunderstand it cross addiction is the the binging and purging phase of it. Yep. And how many times I've heard someone is doing better because they're not using drugs anymore. And my exp- that was my experience with sex. It wasn't consistent. Mm-hmm. There was months where I was a ferocious animal and months where I felt like I had no sex drive. Right. And this is also part of the denial and justification and rationalization. Like addiction wants to stay active. So it's going to switch up the game if you start to get into like noticing that there's a problem. Okay, let me prove that there's not a problem. And justification, rationalization, and denial is not just something that we do with others. It's also something we do with ourselves. So if I can justify that I'm not problematic in these things by being abstinent, then I'm good. But then right. typically what we see is that whack-a-mole. There's another addiction showing up. Um, there's but a th- lot But of- this you're saying something different. You're saying yeah. even... And a person who's completely unaware, they're not thinking about it, they're not stopping it, they're not... They don't there's still to, a binge purge. There's, no, there's a binge purge process that always exists. Yeah. And yeah. what's interesting is that it can be binge purge across different addictions. Go so ahead. you could be binging in workaholism and avoid it in love. Or you could be binging in exercise and, um, and sex and avoid it with food. So like if we look at what's one of my like favorite exercises to do is if we take a person's day, say I wake up and this is an unhealthy day. This is not my day. Hopefully Um, I wake up, I take a Xanax, I drink some coffee, I act out on a pornography site, I go to work, which is high intensity. I take a break to meet up with an anonymous sex partner. I go have drinks after work. What we're an actual person? Yeah, I mean, I've had, I mean, they're living the life if that's <laughs> the case. But yeah, I've had people that are to that intensity or that extreme. As far as every, every part of their day, we can see this binging purging. They haven't eaten for four hours because they're overworking. And, and really, in my mind, when I'm thinking about training a client, it, recovery isn't just I stop acting out my sex addiction or I have a healthy, loving relationship. Of course, those are what we want. But the, the real recovery is that I'm not binging and purging anywhere in my life. Now, when I say that, it sounds really extreme and perfectionistic, but, um, but it's actually there's this healthy gray area where I don't go outside of my personal boundaries to either intensify or numb my experience in life. And that's recovery because then I'm not trying to escape by either overdoing anything or restricting to the point where I'm numb. Interesting. I can go on many, I can jump on many of those, but I do want to, um, I would like you to pull apart the difference between love addiction and codependency. Yeah. So I have this question a lot for clients. It's like, am I a love addict or maybe I'm just codependent because everybody knows that like codependency buzzword. It became really popular in the seventies and like, it was like a big deal. And now everybody knows like, Oh, I'm codependent. (laughs) You know, if I, especially if you have an addict in your life, you've been called a codependent probably. Um, If you're a mom, you may have been called codependent. (laughs) Um, It's like the, but what I define codependency as is I'm using something outside of myself to make me okay, right? Which can look a lot like love addiction, right? But it's not about intimacy. It's about using um, somebody else's event or experience to validate my worth or my value. Now, love addiction is using somebody else's validation or attention or intimacy to show me that I have worth or value, but it's just not, there's a nuanced difference. Is that um, false feeling of intimacy that love addiction has that codependency doesn't necessarily have? Codependency doesn't necessarily have that. It's not about creating intimacy. It's about control. I want to know that I'm safe by having the best plan for your life. And um, codependency can also be about a failed boundary system where I've been enmeshed as a child, so I don't know that I'm allowed to have an identity separate from somebody else. So some of some codependency can be more of that power and control, and other can be coming from more of that passive, I don't have an identity separate from someone. So it's less about intimacy and more about our core sense of self. Uh, I have had clients who come in thinking that they're love addicts, but they don't fit 
with a typical love addict piece or are worried that um, they come in worried that they're love addicts, but it's really just more so this codependency. And outside of um, having different t-shirts or groups we'd <laughs> be a part of based on the different titles, is there different healing that yeah, in my sex, opinion, love, and codependency have? There's similar and different, both. Um, yeah, you get a different, you get a different fellowship for each one. Right. But the type of healing I think that happens with love and sex addiction needs to look at being vulnerable and intimate in a romantic relationship. So whereas codependency, we're looking at how to maintain your internal personal boundaries, which affects your romantic relationships, but isn't focused on your worth or value in romantic relationships or the ability to be intimate with somebody else. It'll help. But really, we're looking at restoring their internal boundary system. Understood. Uh, wh- one definition I've used for my own sex addiction is that my sex, the sex drive wanted to be separate and apart from intimacy. Mm-hmm. Like where I was intimate, I didn't want to have sex. And where I um, was having sex, I wanted no intimacy. That's consistent mm-hmm. with your with your worldview. And then healthy sexuality or recovery would be those kind of overlapping. Yeah. Patrick Carnes has an amazing quote. Uh, like it doesn't make sense to want to have sex with somebody you don't trust. Right. But sex addiction is all about being sexual where there's no trust. And because trust is built with intimacy and trust is built with con- consistent action over time. Whereas sex addiction is about impulsivity and instant gratification. It's, it doesn't, Sex addiction behavior doesn't want to build trust over time and build a loving connection. So when we're in our healthy sexuality, it would make sense. It, it really only makes sense to be sexual when there's trust. Right. One of the um, experiences that shattered some of my denial and made me realize there's an issue. So I was addicted to pornography, prostitutes, massage parlors, strip clubs, uh, probably some more things. But um, I would frequent massage parlors and one time I kind of got to know the, I knew their, I knew their name. I think she may have even give, give me, give me her phone number the end of the experience. And a couple of weeks later I went back to the same place and I didn't book with her, but she walked in and that made me very uncomfortable. And I said, Oh, I booked with, I booked to have two therapists I said, Oh, they didn't tell me at the front. So then a second one came in and I like relaxed and at the end of that experience, I'm like, what was that? Like, mm-hmm. What happened there that this person, I don't know. I just knew their name. I know them once before. There's something off. And it felt like it got my attention. That experience got my attention. It felt almost, it's weird to say, but there was too much intimacy. I knew mm-hmm. this person's name. Right. And that's where a love addict would have felt like their the goal would have been to get the number and would have been to get the name. And that would have been what was more... Um, of the hit about that scenario. It could have been in the first experience it was that. Maybe. But the second experience, of, that freaked me out. It was too, can I, too close. Can I ask, do you know what it is that you were looking for? Oh, I don't talk about this stuff in public. Oh, okay. You don't have to. <laughs> can, can you ask what was I looking for? Like what were you hoping to feel? I just wanted the noise to stop. I just felt like there was too much noise in the brain. I just wanted to stop. Mm. Peace. Yeah, that's what I was uh, going for. No, I have it without that. Thank God. <laughs> That's recovery, I think, too. Like, if there is no peace, there's not recovery yet. And I went through the recovery process. Like I said, I got into 12-step fellowships when I was 18. My father was in recovery, so I had a little bit of a back door. I knew 12-step worked. I don't think I would have gotten clean so young had I not had the experience with him. Um, and I was miserable for the first three, or f- three to five years of my recovery. Because I was still acting out in other addictive disorders. Right. So it's like my recovery had not happened yet. <laughs> like I was not fully in recovery because I wasn't, um, they say in some of the, the rooms, like emotionally sober. I, wasn't, I just wasn't there. I thank God I wasn't using drugs and alcohol. I wasn't dead because I was on that path. But I was still very active in an eating disorder and other addictive disorders. So Yeah. I, I don't mention the name of the program that I attended, but... It was one of the sexual recovery groups, and it wasn't uncommon to have someone walk in who was 10, 15, even 20 years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and say, I got to get control of, of this. Yeah, it's actually, that's what led me into treating sex addiction was 
I was in my master's program and I remember it like it was yesterday because it was traumatic for me. Um, we had, we had a day where we would have to sit and pretend to be therapists with other therapists in the community. That was part of the training protocol. It was the crisis intervention class. They would have therapists come in and volunteer and we as students would, would sit with a therapist happened to be the therapist that I got set up with was one of the senior therapists at the practice that I was hoping to work for. So I got put right into the fire and I was so nervous and we're getting ready to set up the role plays and I get a message that a close friend of mine from 12 step passed away from an overdose. Um, but what I knew about this friend is that me and him had been talking about him needing to get into an S recovery and was acting out in sexual addiction for and kept having chronic relapses. And he was somebody that I was very close to and I was very invested in him. And he died from an untreated sex addiction. And I saw people in the 12 step fellowship, I think with the best intention, but the worst result, um, co-signing his shit. And oh, can we curse here? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> co-signing his shit. And, and I really feel like in the 12 step program that I was in the fear and avoidance of our own unhealed parts led to the overdose of another, another member of our community. So if we're not being rigorous about our own healing, we're setting other people up to die and it was not okay with me. And I just, I really like, I knew that I wanted to work in sex addiction and um, mostly because all my other cohort of my master's program were uncomfortable about it. <laughs> So oh, if I was the one who was comfortable with it and everybody else had an issue, like maybe that's, that's my higher power telling me it's a place that I need to go to. Um, one of the things that led me to speak publicly about sex addiction, because for years I wasn't, I started originally, I knew I, I felt I had to speak because I wanted to speak about child sex abuse in the Orthodox Jewish communities. And in order to sometimes make the point of how it affected me, I said I had an addiction and I was dealing and I was in recovery from an addiction. And I knew that the audience assumed that it was alcohol or drugs. They fill in their blanks. They fill in the blanks. They would have even told you afterwards that I said I was recovering from alcohol. But, and I, but I never touched this the topic. I, there was still a lot of shame attached to it myself. And I saw there was a lot of shame in society as well. One of the things that led me to talk about it, I knew I had to, was that the fellowship I went to was in a building that had several different meetings. You know, it's these clubhouses often yeah. have AA, NA, and, you know, a number of different sex programs and CODA and Al-Anon. And this guy started coming in who was close to 25 years sober in AA. And he had, he had said that in the first meetings. But he said that he was, for the last few months, going to a different S fellowship that was 30 or 40 miles away. And the reason was, was that even though within this clubhouse was his AA and he lived and he lived nearby and it would have made sense to come to our fellowship, he was ashamed of his AA buddies knowing that he was going to an S right. program. Right. And I said, holy shit. Yeah, you can say shit. <laughs> <laughs> I said, if within the recovery community, people are ashamed of this as an addiction, then imagine you step outside of the recovery community. And that's one of the things that led me to say I have to I have to speak about this because if there's the reason is it's not disconnected is that the healing comes from destroying the shame the shame is the the lock on the prison door so knowing that there was still that much shame attached to it I said I got to speak about it so I guess in that way we are um, kindred spirits yeah on the yeah. sex addiction front well it's interesting because I when I first met, first met with my supervisor who. It has now since passed away, but he really formed me into the therapist that I am today. He was like, you sure you want to do this? And I was like, yeah, of course I want to do this. And he was like, okay, um, get ready to be objectified and demeaned and treated like you have nothing <laughs> worth to offer and then fighting an uphill battle against the shame that society has about this. Like you are in – you." what's wrong with you that you want to sign up for this? <laughs> you know? And I was like, Oh, and I was like, okay. Like, I mean, he, he did his job. Like he was testing my grit, like, and to see, was I really wanting to do this or did it just seem like a good money maker? Because as therapists we're taught, the more that we niche, the more profitable we'll be. Right. right. And so it's a very specialized niche. Not a lot of therapists treat that. So he was, and he had been in the field for 30 years treating sex addiction. He had been through like the, the thick of trying to make this into a respectable recovery um, process. 
And he was just trying to test me. And, and I remember sitting there and being like, wait a second, do I, do I want to do this? Like, <laughs> and, and really having to find within myself, like, is this my meaning? Is this where I find purpose and why? Because it doesn't make sense. And at the time I was a 24 year old female. It doesn't make sense as a female who objectifiably people may consider attractive to want to work with sex addicts. And I think that he was right for saying like, what is your deal? And for me, like it did take like owning who I am as a person, how I present, how clients are going to treat me and being able to see past like a client who's engaging in me through their addiction is not the client I'm treating. The client that I'm treating is the person who they are beyond their addiction and who they are underneath the wounding. So you understand that oftentimes at the beginning of interactions, that'll be there. Yeah. I could wear a paper bag covering my entire body and I'll still get objectified. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's not about the person. Sex addiction isn't about a person. And and so I, I do have And you to feel that's helpful or hurtful towards the overall healing process? I think it's helpful. For the right client, I think that the clients who it's hurtful for don't end up in my office. It, you know, but the clients that do end up in my office for the first time in their lives might be having a conversation with me and seeing a person instead of a sex object. And if they do see me as a sex object, we're able to move past that in a way. So because, you talk about it? Yeah, we talk about it. Yeah. Got it. And that takes a lot because here I'm a woman who has been hurt by being sexualized. Like I've been, a, I've been hurt by being objectified. I've been treated in a way that was less than human over that. And so how do I not get triggered when somebody sees me as that? Because part of me is going to say like, oh, that's all you ever really were worth anyway. Right. You know, and that's not true. So there's, there's had to be for me that conversation inside that like whatever that person is seeing about me, they're just seeing only a very inaccurate representation so that they don't have to get close to me. It's not about me. Um, I, th I think it's one of the more damaging aspects of sex addiction. It's not only objectification of women necessarily, because addiction mm -hmm. can go in all directions, but it's objectification of people. Yeah. What's interesting about sex addiction, though, also, it's not just objectification of people. I think that's the wounding part, because we're, we're taking away people's humanities when we make them objects. And we're, we're, we know, like, by research, the minute you're able to take away somebody being a human, you're able to justify all kinds of acts that are harmful to other people. Um, so, like they say, most evil, is, the start of most evil is by dehumanizing people and taking away their humanity. And so objectification, most people don't think of it that way. They think of like, it's just a norm. And most right. people are, it's like the water that we're swimming in, so we don't know we're wet. Um, but um, we objectify places. And we objectify travel and we objectify activities like a sex addict is going to objectify everything in their lives because the way that they interact with anything is how to get my needs met through sexuality. So looking, I think part of also recovery from sex addiction is being able to have a normal life experience where I'm in a hotel room and it's not a sexualized experience or I'm able to get on an airplane and I'm not viewing the world through this objectified experience. I'm living in reality rather than the fantasy of objectification. Yeah, I know exactly what you're, what you're talking about. For me, getting on a plane to different countries, that was, oh, the laws are different here. Like, mm -hmm. Wide open. The whole experience was a sexual experience. Right. I was going on a business trip, but it was much more than a business trip in my, right. in my mind. Right. You touched on something um, kind of tangentially, but I want to, I think it'll be helpful um, to, to discuss it. You'd mentioned that you've seen Orthodox Jewish males showing something that you didn't see in the secular world. And you connected that to something that's probably across the board all Orthodox people experience. So can you, can you speak to that? It seemed, if I understood correctly, what you were saying was something along the lines of it was something about achievement, right? That there's a message that's sent very early on about, about achievement. Speak to that. And yeah, I'm saying. always, I'm, this is where I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> I'm going to say something about orthodox, uh, orthodoxy that is going to. Oh, my audience already knows. Yeah. I'm, I'm, only here, I'm, I'm only here to help. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and mostly because I'm a foreigner to it. Like I, I the briefly, ones, the ones who thought I wasn't, 
they either know their kids called me or their kids have called me. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the yeah. most healthy yeah. thing that we can do for orthodoxy is hold it accountable for oh, how sure. it's failing yeah, there's, us. So. No, I'm saying that I, I have those conversations yeah. and there are times where I bring up these things and I think that um, my audience mm-hmm. and others know that it only comes from yeah. love and wanting to improve it. There's no desire to burn down the village, so to speak. Of course. No, and... Um, When I'm talking about achievement, specifically within the yeshiva system, there's this uh, hierarchy of the boys, and you can speak to your experience. I'm not sure how strict your yeshiva upbringing was, but I'm pretty sure you grew up. Yeah, I grew up in in Crown Heights, Chabad. So Chabad is known as like the more friendly version of that. But in my experience in working with clients, even the Chabad Chabad boys. Chabad's a double-edged sword. Yeah. I'll tell you why. Because it isn't, but they tell you it is. So now you're confused. Yep. Meaning, <laughs> we're, we're told it's not the punishing. We have the more gentle message and everything else. But the message is not gentle. The message is gentle externally within Chabad. The message right. internally to the people growing up within the system is a very harsh message. Mm-hmm. But, we're, but then we're told we don't learn Musr. We don't learn right. the harsh ethics right. that other Jewish groups are rebuked, taught. Right. So we're... <laughs> We, we, we kind of get whacked coming and going because we have an experience that then we're told is not true. We're gaslit right. on it. Right. Exactly. And, and I remember when I first started working in the Orthodox community more intensely, I was in Crown Heights and I was sitting in a Lubavitch home and I was discussing at the Shabbos table what I specialize in and, and the patriarch of the family, the, the head of the household, he, he's like, Chabad doesn't have any of that stuff. And I was like, I'm here treating Chabadniks. <laughs> like, uh, it does have this stuff, you know? And, and I think it, this speaks to human nature. We, we want to believe that anything that we see as painful, scary, shameful has Doesn't nothing to do there. with us. Right. Not here. Because I'm doing everything. I think the world is fair. I'm doing everything to not have that experience. So the world's going to treat me fairly. And I'm not going to experience some of the hardship or fear or shame that other people experience. So we create this false bubble that like somehow we're doing it right. And if I can tell what other people are doing wrong, I can prevent um, unnecessary pain or unexpected catastrophe from happening in my life. And it's just not true. Right. We've been... Yeah. Uh, how long ago did this happen? Uh, six years ago. Six years ago. I'm not doing my job. <laughs> 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 Gotta get out there. Because if that thought is still there, then I'm obviously not being heard. So um, One Gotta of the things of in... In the yeshiva system, and like I was saying, this hierarchy within the boys is that the the boy who can learn the best or the quickest or the most intensely or the is rewarded with the most pedestal type of behavior with the rebbies or with his family or within his community. There is a value in being a really good Torah scholar. Isn't um, that the case everywhere? In just about one thing. Oh right, you're <laughs> like saying this is where in orthodoxy I think that there's there's no other outlets to be good enough in. For right, the boys. it's not you're good academic, but he's good at sports. They're good at music. Right, right. everybody's like and and I grew up secular and I grew up in an overachieving, perfectionistic, rigid home with with inconsistent emotional stuff, and obviously that affected me. But I did find ways that I could achieve that were outside of the system. So I did have the academic achievement, but I was also good at art, and I could do other things, and and I could diversify my talents in order to try and get my needs met when my needs weren't met. Whereas for the boys, I think that But how is that a different message on achievement overall? um, I don't know that it's a different message. I think it's the intensity and rigidity of the option for achievement. So there's, it's so black and white. It's you're either this or you're completely bad. And you feel like that somehow evolves into an addiction. Because of the intensity of the shame. So if I only have one option, I'm, a, I'm an excellent Torah scholar who fits into the, the school system, or I'm a bad kid. So what are my, okay, if I'm not what I'm seeing the top of my class being and I don't feel like I can get there for whatever reason. Right, then I'm done. There's I'm nothing done. else I can do. There's no other options for me. And if I do have other options that I'm good at, I'm creative, I do these other things, uh, you're shamed for it even more. There's right. no room to be human outside of that. Now, I'm talking about the worst of the worst. I think that there are communities that are trying to heal this and are trying to give options. And I've heard other like positive stories, even within some of the or- ultra-Orthodox communities, where the boys are given tasks to building or um, 
are given creative outlet doing digital design. Like and there are different schools popping different. up that are that are catering to this. Right, for sure. So there was a time where it was viewed as these students don't belong in our institutions and they go where they go. And today there are certain schools which will say, okay, we'll teach different arts or we'll teach different skills and you know, someone wants to be an electrician or a programmer or something, we'll we'll give those tools within an Orthodox Jewish um, framework. The thing with the achievement thing is if I'm not meeting that achievement, I'm not meeting my need for belonging. I'm not meeting my need for validation. I'm not meeting any of my kids do need belonging. Kids do need validation. They do need positive feedback about themselves to start to build a sense, a healthy ego, a healthy sense of self. If I'm getting none of that, then my only option is to go to fantasy because I'll imagine the day when possibly somebody will meet those needs. And again, this isn't a conscious process. It's totally right. subconscious. It's happening without our awareness when it's starting to develop. But that's also where that love addiction goes because it's like one day I'll feel the belonging, nurturing, connection, approval that I've always craved and that I felt like I was a failure in in this area. Um, let so me, I think, yeah. Let me throw something at you that I think I experienced and um, I've seen it in others because I sometimes speak to 18, 19, 20, I've done it like four or five times, spoken to that age, and there was something I've seen pretty consistently, and I, I want to connect it to like the bar and, bar mitz, bar and bat mitzvah idea. It's that this abrupt entering into adulthood. Mm -hmm. So 10, 11, okay, cool, you're a kid. And you can dress like a kid and you can act like a kid, but now it's your bar mitzvah, you're a man, and you're treated in, there's this like end of childhood. And I experienced that when when I saw it in others, I was like, wow, I went through that as a kid too. As soon as we hit 13, we're expected to act as full adult with all the seriousness and all the, um, I don't, don't want to say perfection, but that we had to be, we, we were, hey, you're an adult now. You're bar mitzvah. And for a girl at 12 years old, you're bat mitzvah. You're an adult now. What's interesting is typically in Jewish stuff, like it actually fits with our biology really well. Like the halacha around like family purity, like fits perfectly with the biology for um, procreation, right? Like that's one but of that's the common not what's things. Happening. But that's not what's happening. The bar and bat mitzvah age is not biologically appropriate for a kid to be an adult yet. Our brains are not brains, in the society. There may have been societies. Yeah, where maybe it was. in the past. Definitely not now. Definitely not for a while. Right. Um, and so our brains, we're expecting 13, uh, you're telling a 13 year old whose brain hasn't developed fully that he has to make adult decisions when he's not working with an adult brain or she's not working with an adult brain. And that also sets people up for failure because it's like, I'm supposed to be something that I feel like I can't match. And so I'm, I have this, it's called being put on a pedestal. You're, you're a 13 year old who's being treated like a man but you know that you're not a man. Some part of you knows that like, I'm still a little kid inside, but I have to fake being a man. So now here we have image management. I have to pretend like I'm something that I'm not. And I'm, and I'm denying my true nature, which means that there's a lack of development because when I have to deny parts of myself, they don't get to fully develop with me. I have to hide them away. So this, this, whatever immaturity or, um, youngness that is that 13 year old part of us gets pushed away and then never gets to develop into an adult. And then you have 26 year old men getting married and wondering why they still feel like they're 13. Is yeah. the word shame appropriate for what you're yeah. describing? Yeah. I think a yeah. shame's like, everything. I could everything. Everything. If I got a dollar for every time I made shame, I wouldn't need to be a therapist, you know, like I, or, or said the word shame. It's everything. And, and what we're saying here is that there are certain aspects of the culture that contribute and add to the, to shame. the shame, to the shame, to it's the denial of someone. self. Yeah. Yeah. It's dehumanizing. Yeah. And that's where I have adult men coming in to my office who have subscribed completely to the system and been amazing Torah scholars or members of their community, but they are empty inside. They're dying inside because there's no, uh, they're not allowed to be human. So they have to act out in all kinds of ways to cope with the pain of the lack of humanity. It doesn't feel good to not be allowed to be a human. And so we seek ways to numb that, which then end up making us feel less human. And right. it's a toxic cycle. Yeah. And the irony, it's where we find out we're the most human. Right. Yeah, that's a, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, I was thinking about this recently, like, why am I not suffering anymore? Right. I, I've been in recovery now for 16 years. Um, 
And why is it that at 16 years now and for quite a while, I'm not suffering, I'm not miserable, I'm not getting hijacked by my trauma. I know when my defects of character or these, that my addictive processes are starting to show up and I'm able to catch them before they become painful. I, I've gone through painful experiences, but I'm not suffering anymore. And why is that? Like, oh, it's because I, I let myself be a human. I'm a person, right. I'm a whole person. And my pain is not the only thing that defines me. And my success is not the only thing that defines me. And my contribution to somebody else's life or my um, positive attributes or the way I care for my kids doesn't define me. I'm not whittled down to just a piece of a person at any moment. I'm a whole human. And it's comfortable to be a whole human. It's like I can breathe into all the space that I'm supposed to take up in the world. And I'm understanding the quote better now. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. I thought maybe you didn't even know the quote was there. Like some people build like my website, my office's website, my business. I would have no idea what it says. On it. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to be with the fine art degree. I like doing a lot of the creative stuff with you. my business. So it's like That's part it. of my yeah. joy. No, it's a good uh, website. Is it Lionhearted Consulting? Yeah, Lionhearted, Lionhearted Counseling. Counseling, Lionhearted Counseling. Shameless plug. Yeah, no I don't shame. mind. Yeah, no, <laughs> I have great. no shame. I think, no, absolutely. Great. I think like too, the... The the thing with that lion-hearted brand and why I chose that is I would have to be embodying it to justify having it as the name. Like I take a big honor in the concept behind that, um, which I talk about in one of those promo videos on my site. But we'll talk about it now. <laughs> um, the idea. So for me, it's like I'm I'm big into astrology. I just, I'm a basic white girl about that stuff. Like, I'm a Leo. I'm the best sign that there possibly is. Mm -hmm. You know, all the stereotypes, grandiose, but also very, like, giving. And and when we're looking at astrology, I, I like astrology because it kind of gives us, like, the basics of, like, where we could go into our most extreme defect and where we could be our healthiest. And a healthy Leo is generous and um, protects her pack and takes care of others around her in a way that's free and giving, but also with a pride um, and... With like, a pride meaning a group. With a with a pride with a group. Got it. Okay. That it's not about being alone. An unhealthy Leo is in isolation, and I lived in isolation for a long time. And that was part of my work in recovery as well, is not having to be perfect and not having to be isolated. Um, I hit my one of my emotional bottoms in recovery because I thought that I had to have all of my shit together all the time. And it's not possible. I was living up to some perfectionistic standard that I thought my dad needed me to be in order to be lovable and it wasn't real and I and I crumbled under that pressure and so uh, in community with others um, humble generous um, able to share power and not hoard things just for yourself so that lion-hearted brand came from all of the healthy things about that Ast astrological sign that I wanted to embody and that I hoped to embody and then coming through that from like this heart led place. And this is again, before I ever decided to be Jewish and we know the, the beautiful quote, which is that like words from the heart go into the heart. Mm -hmm. And I, and this is where like there are absolute truths in the universe, I believe. And 100%. so it, it was just an absolute truth before I ever learned anything about Torah or, or orthodoxy is that I, I wanted to come from that truth, that heart and, and that there I don't believe that I can be led wrong by my heart. What prompted you to become Jewish? Why would someone do this? Oh, this is <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those like questions that always comes up, especially because I I was working in the Orthodox community right around the time that I started to go through my conversion process, um, and so I was seeing everything that was I mean the most painful things about orthodoxy I was working with on a daily basis, all of the severe trauma, the childhood sexual abuse, the neglect, the and then you jumped in head first. rejection. And I'm like, yeah, I want to be Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, but it's like the same thing with like, I want to work with sex addicts. <laughs> like, <laughs> that sounds really like my life. It's like, I, it's not necessarily about like, I want to dive head first into the most painful and difficult waters. It's that I believe that that's where I find my greatest purpose and belonging is in the places that are going to bring out the more, more of my humanity. So, um, the thing with orthodoxy for me was that I'd been on a very long spiritual journey prior to choosing to convert. And I've done all kinds of crazy weird stuff in recovery as far as spirituality and meditation, silent meditations, retreats, and all kinds of mmming and vooing and breath work. And I had been on a really long spiritual journey prior to converting. 
And I'd gotten to this place where I felt a complete oneness with the universe i know this sounds so silly no, it doesn't sound silly to me it sounds it's no there's no words that can really explain you're talking to too many religious people that's why you think yeah, it's silly you're right it doesn't exactly. sound silly to me. <laughs> um and i was so connected and every moment of my day i would look around and i would see god and it was it's it's a beautiful way to live but i was not connected with anybody in my life i wasn't finding peers that i felt like i could talk about spirituality with and that i was really connecting to and at the time i was was treating a Satmar client and his family came to do some family work and I'm sitting with his family and we start talking about got the practice and divine <laughs> providence and how God shows up in our lives and and the beauty and oneness of the universe and I'm sitting here and I'm like oh god I'm supposed to convert <laughs> like how am I talking to a religious Satmar guy and I'm at the time like as secular as it gets uh, like no connection with anything religious. I was very anti-religion, actually. What was uh, resonating? Yeah, but here I am. I feel more connected than than any other person in my life right now, and it just doesn't make sense. And I felt like there was a lot of other things that made me think about converting prior. Um, all of my spiritual beliefs I found were based off of Torah learning. Uh, this was a couple years before deciding, and I went to a friend who's who grew up Jewish, and I asked her. I was like, "Do you think I should convert? If all my spiritual beliefs are Jewish, shouldn't I be a Jew?" And I dated Jewish guys, and it just seemed like weird. And she was like, "Don't, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> you get all the perks with none of the the negatives. So like, just enjoy the perks. Do all your right. spiritual Jewish based stuff, and like, leave the the rebuking to us." And um, and so I didn't. She she deterred me. And then it was just like a series of events. I accidentally started getting referred Jewish clients. All of a sudden, my caseload was Orthodox clients. I'm um, showing up in recovery and I end up in a Jewish recovery center here in Boca or down in Boca. And it's like, oh, I'm not Jewish. Why is this happening? It was like one thing after another. And so I just, I, my assumption was that unless I chose to convert, God was just going to keep throwing stuff in my face to try and force me to convert because that's what my soul was supposed awesome. to do. Awesome. And in learning, it felt right. yeah, it, it was more than just feeling right. It was the next step if I wanted to continue to grow because I had all these lofty ideas, feeling one with the universe. So who doesn't want that? Like I had, I had achieved what most people were looking for in spirituality, but it wasn't enough. And have you found it? I'm Within finding Judaism? it. I'm finding it. Within Judaism. Um, you know what's interesting about the conversion process is it took everything so practical. Right. It took everything into this earth. So I went from feeling very like – just the breath of fresh air that is being connected with, with a God into learning about the nuanced halacha of the fabric that I'm wearing. Right. And it, the two, it's hard to bridge that gap. Very hard. Right. Like, like what's the connection here? What does it matter? And, um, and I've been Orthodox for quite a few years now and I'm still finding that balance and, and, how do I bridge those practices with the practical? I think is that next step of work is bringing God into this world through a practical application. And that's I, also why I converted. I haven't read the book, but I was a number of years ago, I was talking to a rabbi and I expressed this point that it felt like where there was spirituality, there wasn't religion. And where there was religion, there wasn't spirituality. And he said, there's a rabbi who wrote a book just on this called the Halachic Man hmm. by... Halachic means um, Jewish law. So, like the legal man, or it was. Mm -hmm. The Halachic man by, I think, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik. Mm -hmm. so, Name sounds I familiar, read but it. I haven't read it. Yeah. He's a fairly well known yeah. rabbi. I think he passed, but fairly well known rabbi. And uh, for whatever reason, the name stuck in my head, which is kind of weird for a book name to stick in. And this is probably going back 10 years. I haven't read it. But. It's stuck on your in my life's head, path, so, apparently. <laughs> so, so I'm sharing it. But there does seem to be something there in terms of being able to find the spirituality in the routine. Yeah. Although I'm not. Yeah, I'm not there I, because I definitely feel like I – that's not true. I'm not not there. Um, in my work, I find God every second. And that's, I think, why I can lean towards a little bit of workaholism is I'm, I'm in that – any addiction is I'm trying to fill a spiritual void, right? And so in my work, I find a lot of spiritual satisfaction and I can get workaholic with it because like the more clients I see, the more God hits I'm going to yeah, get. Right. Like, <laughs> But in synagogue, you don't get any of those. 
In synagogue, I do, but I do. where I get it the most is in nature. Got it. So that's where there's a balance. I, I get it in davening, but only if I'm learning davening in Jewish right. prayer. Um, I only get it if I'm learning about what I'm asking for. I, I also grew up in recovery. I grew up uh, right. from a young child. To prayer. I was introduced to spirituality through recovery, by the right. way. Not right. I was. Um, what's the opposite of introduced? <laughs> <laughs> I was pushed away from spirituality yeah. through religion in some way. Now that I'm, now I'm kind of bridging the the gap between the two. And one of my first sponsors told me that. I'll know my spiritual healing has taken root when I reconnect it to my Jewish roots. Hmm. And I'm finding that. I found his words to be somewhat uh, prophetic. And he was not Jewish. He was a, he was a monk, actually. <laughs> so not Jewish at all. Um, I guess last question I have, or at least last topic. Uh, there seems to be a spiritual renaissance of sorts within the healing community. From breathwork, psychedelic therapies, ketamine clinics popping up all over the place. Um, a number of states legalizing psychedelics. New York State just uh, proposed that. You have thoughts on this renaissance, thoughts on these things, or a thought of, I don't want to talk about it, it's fine. Too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have thoughts. I'm still trying to figure out where I fit in with all of it. Like, what's my belief as a therapist? Because clinically, if we look at the research, there's a ton of evidence to support that the psych the psychedelic thing is like the hot topic right now. Everybody's right. trying to figure out where their position is. I think a lot of therapists are also jockeying for the financial leverage that they're going to get <laughs> by being first on the on the map with it. Uh, there's also people who just want to help. But <laughs> I see within the business of therapy, um, buzzwords are really popular so like i said the codependency was a big buzzword and then you know and we hear about all these emdr emdr is extremely effective i've done upwards of 20 hours of emdr of myself like i love emdr but it's a buzzword you're told like go to emdr that'll fix you or um ifs don't see a therapist who's not trained in ifs ifs is the new one that's going around and i'm like internal family systems is part work which is inner child work it's all the same thing and we and we we want to compartmentalize our healing into a one thing that's going to be the thing and and i think i hear it all the time and as humans like we just accidentally slip into this like now that's the thing it's going to be the thing which is just codependency with our healing something outside of me that is this one thing is going to be the ticket whereas it's this is it's a blanket of healing it's not one piece of the the square so maybe psychedelics are part of the blanket, but they're not the one buzzword. But within that, we have to be, I feel like a responsibility as a therapist to be on the cutting edge of, of empirical evidence to support our clients. It's, it's my responsibility to give competent care. So if this is healing people, I need to know it. Um, and I haven't figured out where I sit with it yet because I would not choose to do a mood or mind altering substance like that could create a DMT result because I'm scared. I don't want to trigger a relapse for myself. I don't want to activate the addictive neuropathways. We know enough about brain science to say that our brain remembers uh, a high. So I'm triggering a high in my brain and I don't want to risk that could lead me to lapses or using it in a way that's not functional. And I know all the arguments. People will say like nobody wants to use psychedelics to get high because of how healing of a process it is. Actually, I just don't agree with that based off the brain science. Does that mean but that people... Was it based on this brain science? Wouldn't that happen to me? Like if I had sex with my wife, if this ever happens one day. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, if, if I have sex with my wife, wouldn't, um, according to this brain science, wouldn't it trigger a relapse in sex addiction? That's Why would it be any a different? Brilliant question, because process addictions operate in the brain differently than substance addictions. Maybe. From what we know right now. So with substance addiction versus a process addiction, our brain has a natural pathway for arousal. The addictive the arousal pathway gets hijacked with addictive with an addictive disorder. So sex addiction hijacks that neural pathway and starts creating an intensity seeking in that pathway that's not our normal baseline. But because there's already the foundation of it, we're not altering and creating something that isn't that we can't come back to. So recovery and sex addiction are other process but it addictions. Would. But it would if I um, – a process addiction could trigger – meaning I can th – there are times 
we're talking about. There are times where I've masturbated and it brought me back to that triggered space. Right. And that same behavior with my wife doesn't. Right. I know we're being specific, but it's okay. Meaning sex. So sex without intimacy. Mm-hmm. That's what would I was potentially bring up was the trigger intimacy. that. Right. Right. Sex with intimacy will not trigger that. Right. And I've seen it for myself. Right. That's why I'm giving the the specifics. I've noticed it and I've been surprised by it. How can something? It's literally the same thing. Nothing. Nothing has changed. Uh, the the achievement of an orgasm is releasing the same chemicals. So Correct. why does why do one I feel lead so to a different? phenomenon of craving and one doesn't? Yes. Or why does one leave me feeling energized and one leave me feeling the opposite, right. almost as if I'm in a bubble? So maybe it would be the same with with um, I meaning a mind. Maybe it would be the same with psychedelics, a mind altering substance that's introduced to the body with the intent of connecting with ourselves and healing Mm -hmm. would create one experience and a mind altering substance with the intent intent of escaping from our reality would create that. I think it's possible. I don't disagree. And that's also where it's like, that's where for me, I'm scared at the same time. I've had clients who identify as substance abuse in, in recovery from substance abuse who've had really amazing psychedelic experiences were able to integrate it into their current therapy I'm not a therapist going around saying, like, don't go use this new tool that we have. I just don't know yet where I land on it. Yeah, this new old tool. This 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 resurgence (laughs) of a tool. I also, because of the way that I work, I don't feel I have the right to ask a client to go do a psychedelic trip if I haven't gone through that experience recently. I mean, there's no therapeutic process that I'm taking a client through that I haven't done personally. And while I've trip balls in my active addiction <laughs> like woo uh, it's not the same i know it's not the same and i agree with you that in the pursuit of escape perhaps the psychedelic experience doesn't does, would trigger addiction whereas in the pursuit of healing it doesn't activate that i'm just scared because i don't right. want to risk my life on that i i'm not in a place of enough suffering where it would make sense for me to introduce a substance to my body that that could possibly trigger a relapse. And maybe my fear is an indication that I need to go do a psychedelic, but <laughs> who right. knows? You may have seen me smiling um, earlier when you were saying something about we think there's one thing versus the other that's going to heal us, whereas psychedelic experiences often connect us to the oneness that is, and there isn't one that is over the other. But yeah. I understand what you're saying, that we land back here, and then we're saying, oh, it's this that um, that healed us. I'll share uh, one of my own experiences just yeah. for the purpose of this conversation yeah. um, where, you know, th- there are a number of different medicines and people have spoken about, you know, ketamine is the one that's legalized and getting a lot of right. publicity. I have no experience with it. Um, I feel that like ayahuasca has had tremendous impact mm-hmm. on my life and specifically in relation to sex addiction I explained to it, I became aware of an aspect of my sex, not the aspect, like a root, maybe the root of my mm-hmm. sex addiction in a way that I never understood previously. I'll share it with you and yeah. know what you think um, within an ayahuasca ceremony. And what I'll say about ayahuasca as well, you know, I won't do that. I'll just talk about the uh, root of the uh, of the sex addiction that became clear to me through an ayahuasca journey. And it's that I'd become so trapped in my head, in my mind, in many different ways. A, I didn't want to feel my feelings. B, I, I thought my thoughts would figure everything out and I didn't want to, like, oh, my intuition is saying, no, I got to figure this out. And what ayahuasca had shown me is that because, first of all, the brain can be programmed, the body can't. Right. Meaning an outside force can program my brain. Mm-hmm. Can make, you take a child and you can get him to believe almost anything you want. You look at different countries with different beliefs, and at a young age, people are doing all sorts of things. And you don't have to go to another country; you go to this country, and right, we're all being programmed in in different ways. And I'm a product of programming, as as are you. But that mm-hmm. programming is in the mind. Right. No one can ever tell our body that something doesn't feel right, that doesn't feel right. So first, it introduced me to that: is a trust your body more than you trust your mind. But you don't, and that's what the sex addiction is: is because I've been so trapped in my head the body is kind of fighting back and its last resort is you are going to feel me. And if there's the the last thing I can do is throw these urges at you that will eventually get you to 
um, feel the physical and pleasurable aspects of your body, then that's what I'll do. And I'll keep at you with that obsession until you recognize that the body is where the intelligence is at. And once I'm in there and I'm living from that space, then the addiction doesn't have um, a, a hold on me. And that clarity changed my whole relationship with the addiction. Yeah. So does that resonate? Does that land? A hundred percent that resonates. And I, and what you're talking about is like your nervous system was screaming for you to pay attention to it being dysregulated. And by being in your head, you couldn't be in the body. I don't want to go there. Yeah. yeah Why would you? Yeah. <laughs> it's too scary. You're going to surrender to something that is going to tell you everything that you don't want to know about what's going on. I want to operate in robot mode. Correct. Um, and, and intellectualizing is such a dangerous coping mechanism because it's so rewarded and it feels so good. Oh, mm -hmm. It's such a relief. And you don't have to surrender. You don't have to be vulnerable. If I can figure out and think my way through things, I never have to surrender to a higher power. I never have to surrender to a spouse. I never have to surrender to the experience of life because I'm always in control. And, and the body is like just begging for you to be in reality and experience it. And, and so, yeah, it's beautiful. Right. The irony is this was after I was introduced to ayahuasca after seven or eight years in, um, recovery. So I thought I'd heard surrender. I thought I'd done surrender right. and I did. I surrendered right. a lot, but I didn't surrender this. Yeah. What's interesting. I wonder for myself uh, because of how rigorous I am about my own healing journey. Like, why do I, why was I able to surrender without the use of psychedelics? Like, why did I have, why is my experience that I don't feel at this point in time, I need that type of healing medicine. Um, and I can, I identify it with a meditative experience where I was able to achieve the feeling that I missed so much about certain drugs, which included psychedelics. And it was that oneness experience. Right. And, and when I was able to have that with for me, it was about being able to have it sober. It was like, there's hope. I'm not going to be alone with my own self. I can, I can be in connection with a higher power all the time. And all of this is loving and all of this is kind. And I was never imperfect as I thought I was, or I was never as shameful as I thought I was. And, and I got lucky. I feel like that I had that through meditation and that's where I would never want to prevent somebody from getting that type of healing. If, if psychedelics were the way, because Here's the other thing with psychedelics is there is really great research. It creates neuroplasticity in the brain. We're able to change the way we think. We go from rigid thinking to flexible thinking when we're on a psychedelic. And, and so if I can't access my flexible thinking any other way than a psychedelic, why would I inhibit somebody healing that way? I think for me, it's more of a hesitation of what's right, my I wasn't, place. Right. I was asking more yeah. from your viewpoint as a therapist not as an individual for yourself just yeah. if you had a perspective oh that's a, the two get pretty right. <laughs> close together <laughs> i think my perspective as a therapist is to do what's the best clinically for a, right a and client. the research is there the research is clearly research there is that there's for sure there. a lot of benefits to it i still feel like i need to have a, a comprehensive discussion for my like full unbridled thoughts on this because i'm not promoting i'm not no. suggesting it is I, everyone check for themselves and a conversation on this would probably take one to three hours for me to really um, encapsulate my thoughts on the subject but there's no question that for me um, it's had a uh, it's had profound uh, profound healing so I just wanted to hear yeah your thoughts on I think it. also working in addiction for so long and being in recovery from substances addiction is so cunning like it'll trick you into thinking you're doing the right thing when you're doing the thing that is actually going to end up destroying you and, and I've had that experience like with all the best intention, thinking I was doing the right, most healthy thing for myself. And I was slowly deteriorating my, my soul and people around me and all that um, with thinking it was good. So, And you're connecting this to staying away from psychedelics or going towards it? That, um, my hesitation with people with prior substance abuse issues mm -hmm. using psychedelics is that they may get out of hand with them without noticing that it's a problem because it's so justified so and i've seen like people who are just it progresses it I goes from ayahuasca one time and getting this amazing insight and i do agree with doing multiple journeys because of the, the insight gained but then it progresses into other psychedelics and other substances until they're spending their day medicated right, well, well i would say to all therapists who are concerned about it as someone who's explored the psychedelic world is that a good part of a good part of the value that's achieved from it possibly more than 50% is the integration that happens yeah. during it and bringing it back into the real world. And that's the difficult part of it Agreed. to have an experience anyone can give you and you can always get it cheaper because you just mm -hmm. 
find a practitioner on the side of the road in Peru or find someone who wants to learn. There's, there's, these are accessible, different ones in different ways. That's not the way someone is going to have their foothold in this. It's more about the experience around it and the integration through it, which that's where people really need the help and, um, and it's an invaluable support that I think therapy and many of the modalities that therapy teaches lends an invaluable lens to uh, help someone integrate these experiences. Because I've watched that. I've watched the experiences without the integration, and they don't have the they don't have this nearly the same value that they do without it. Well, what's, In any case, what's interesting, I'm going back to circling back, I, I had an experience with my therapist at 13 of safety. I did not integrate that experience. I did not let it fundamentally change, change me to the point where I was able to lead a life where I felt safe in the world. And I think that's also one thing that therapists don't realize their power in is that it's not just about integrating the psychedelic experience. It's about helping the client integrate every experience that is new, safe, recovery-based in their life, the way they feel in their bodies you were talking about with interview, like letting your body experience safety, vulnerability, compassion, um, and sitting in that and not running from it and integrating it. So yes, there's the awareness or the thoughts that need to be integrated. There's also the, the physical, the, the sensory experience of our bodies that needs to be integrated, which we talked about with the yes. journey. All right. Thank you so much for uh, coming on. Enjoy the conversation. Really nice. Thank you so much. Awesome. Ellie. Thank you.